This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. In this edition of the Alcazine Brief, we talk with Mr. Isaac Israel. Mr. Israel is the CEO of Kit of Pharma, a pharmaceutical drug development company developing new options to treat osteoarthritis pain and hypertension simultaneously, as well as novel anti-cancer drugs. Before joining the company in 2012, he was the founding CEO of B Contact. Since 2008, Mr. Israel has also served as the owner and founding CEO of Uneri Capital, a financial consulting firm specializing in the healthcare sector. And today, Mr. Israel also serves as a member of the board of directors of various public and private healthcare corporations, including as chairman of the board of NextGen Biomed. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Yonkersin Brief. Kit of Pharma is developing an investigational drug called NT219, a novel small molecule drug designed to target two signal proteins that are part of the anti-cancer drug resistance mechanism. Based on recent findings, Kitov researchers demonstrated that NT219 binds directly to the two proteins. In previous preclinical models, where NT219 was administered in combination with various oncology therapies, outstanding efficacy in preventing acquired resistance and reversing tumor resistance was demonstrated. By lowering development risk and cost through a fast-track regulatory approval of novel therapeutics, Keto Pharma plans to make a meaningful impact on patients' lives. Immuno-oncology is increasingly recognized as the future in cancer therapy, and many immuno-oncology candidates, including NT219, have been identified and are currently being tested in preclinical studies or in the clinic. Let's listen to our interview with Mr. Isaac Israel. I'm here with Isaac Israel from uh, Kitov Pharma. It's an innovative uh, pharmaceutical company developing first-in-class combination oncology therapies. Uh, welcome to the show, is Isaac. Thank you very much, and thank you for having us and me here. So before we're going to talk a little bit about the therapies that you are developing, tell me a little bit more about yourself and maybe tell a little bit more about the company. Um, I hear the name is is definitely an interesting name that you have and and before the pro- before we start recording the show uh, you were telling me a little bit about that name uh, i think our listeners would be fascinated you know what let's start with the name and then i will provide a short background about myself so speaking about the name keto this is this is interesting because keto means it is good the phrase it is good now there is an expression in Hebrew that can be translated to twice good which is originally from, from the book of Genesis, uh, the first book of the Bible. In the first book of, uh, of the Bible, Genesis, God said, it is good, once after every day of creation, after the first day, after the second day, and then when you arrive to the third, third day, to Tuesday, God said, it is good twice. So in Hebrew, when you use the phrase, twice is good, you actually want to mention something or you, you want to mention two good things that are happening at the same day. Now, all these stories connected to, to keto because when keto was founded, its first drug, Consensi, this is our first drug, it was eventually brought to FDA approval in 2018. This drug was a combination drug. It was a combination of uh, celecoxib and amnodipine, two, di- two uh, different ingredients. So the name keto has actually a double meaning. You know, first meaning is by being a combination or developing a combination drug of two good things. And the second is about the company that we are doing a good thing, not only once, but twice. So that, that's, that's the background about, uh, about the name keto. Personally speaking about my background, so I first, I, I, I studied mathematics and then I started my career in the software industry. So it's far away from what, what, uh, what I do today. Yeah. So at the time, I was in algorithm development. I did uh, software development, and I was also a team leader for a software company. Then I founded my own company, my own software company. It was back in 2001. The company grew very fast, and eventually I took it public uh, at the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange in 2006. Now by, by that time, spent in, I, I, I had spent a few, uh, to spend a few months hospitalized to deal with a very severe spinal cord uh, inflammation. 
I found myself, you know, watching the, the work of the physicians that were around me at the, at the hospital. And I say to myself, hey, you know, these guys are doing something, the work, which is uh, much more interesting than what you do. This is much more important than what you do. So, and it, it looked just much more interesting than just selling uh, software. So after a few months, I took a decision to sell my company and pursue a completely different direction in the biotech space. I then joined the healthcare fund uh, Focus VC, and I spent a few years investing in biotech companies, helping uh, with their business development, uh, fundraising, uh, etc. Then in 2011, I joined a pharmaceutical company that was uh, focused on dermatology as a CEO and managed the company until we took it uh, public in the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. And then at the time, I, I, I actually met the Keto team. This was uh, 2013 and decided, decided to, to, to join the company. So I'm uh, with Keto since 2013 until today for the, for the past six years. Well. That's definitely a, a very interesting career. I mean, it's not, it's not that often that you hear that people really switch uh, complete territories from IT uh, to to pharma and, and medicine. It's uh, quite interesting. I, I've, I've seen a lot of people making a similar switch within life sciences, from IT to life sciences yeah. and the manufacturing, yeah. because a lot of the technologies are very similar in both industries, but really making something a switch from IT to to health and, and medicine. That's definitely a, a very interesting uh, switch. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Now, let's talk a little bit because the, the interesting thing about what you noticed um, was you thought it was very worthful, very, very valuable what uh, those doctors were doing when you were dealing with an, a number of physicians um, back home. Yeah. Let's look a little bit about what your company is doing. Of course, you are developing yes. a number of, of, of drugs in the immuno-oncology area. Tell me a little bit about that. So nowadays, uh, this is our focus. This is not how the company started. So, so uh, with your permission, I, I would just speak a few words about uh, uh, the history of the company and how we actually got into the oncology space. Yeah, sure. Initially, uh, Keto was founded by a group of uh, ex-FDA physicians, chemists, uh, executives that were led by Dr. Paul Wainer. The company was originally formed based on a combination drug, as I mentioned before, from Sensi. It was designed to treat uh, osteoarthritis, related pain, and hypertension, which is a major side effect of, right. uh, of the NSAID. NSAIDs today are the, are the highest prescribed class of medications globally. Now, following the FDA approval of Consensi, as I mentioned in 2018, uh, and its licensing in the US, China, and South Korea, and also following the acquisition of our first oncology drug, uh, NT219, uh, Kito has transformed completely into an oncology-focused company. And this is our uh, therapeutic uh, area of interest nowadays. So CM24, initially, this is, uh, this is an immuno checkpoint. This is a, a, a monoclonal antibody a drug that is designed to treat uh, cancer. Mm -hmm. And it's a monoclonal antibody that is targeting CKM1. I can, of course, uh, elaborate a little bit more about CKM1, but this is a new, very important surface protein in the immune, in the biology of the can of, of cancers in general. CKM1 is also a member of the CKM family. Uh, you have CKM1, CKM2, CKM3, etc., and it binds CKM1 binds both to itself by by a homo dimerization, and also to CKM5 by hetero. Demerization. Then there's, that, that means that there is prevention, or the CKM1 prevents the interaction of the tumor cell with the immune cell, which is the CKM1 to CKM1, or CKM1 to CKM5. And therefore, uh, it doesn't allow the immune, immune attack of the tumor cell. Now, by blocking this antigen with CM24, which is our antibody, we allow the immune cells to recognize and infiltrate the tumor and eventually to kill it. So this is this is the basic idea behind the behind the CM24. Now going going back and trying to understand the problem or why uh, CM24 is an important drug. Let's start by by uh, uh, speaking about the problem that we are uh, addressing here. So as you as you actually pointed out, immunotherapy today has shown very promising results in tackling difficult to treat cancers. This is well known. 
In fact, immune oncology drugs are not only the future, but the, the present. You know, they, they are here, right. they are here today. And nowadays, we know, we, if you look back at 2018, we know that the uh, total annual sales of, uh, of the immune oncology uh, drugs, especially Keytruda and Abdivo, are greater than $16 billion just you know, last year. So that's, that's a huge market already, and it's, it's expected to, to, to grow uh, dramatically. However, a major current challenge that we have with, uh, with such of, uh, you know, single agent immunotherapies is the relatively low response rate that we have with the, with the main PD-1 inhibitors like Keytruda or Optivo. And also the second problem of acquired resistance to the, their uh, inability of these PD-1s to target the multiple pathways that are used by the tumors to evade the immune system. Mm-hmm. So uh, here at Keto, uh, we believe that effective combination therapies of novel immune checkpoint inhibitors are necessary for the development of efficacy, efficient, and long-lasting cancer treatment. Our solution, or what we strongly believe, is in the multiple mechanism of action approach in oncology drug development. We believe that uh, this approach recognizes first the complexity of the biology of the cancer, and then understanding that a single mechanism of action is, in most of the cases, is simply not enough to overcome this complexity. We need more. Right. We believe that this approach will enable cancer drugs to prevent the tumor to evade the immune system and to circumvent the alternative uh, survival pathways that are developed by the tumors. So what we do here at Keto, uh, not only by uh, CM24, but also with N219, uh, we are implementing this uh, multiple mechanism of action approach also with the uh, NT219. And once again, since we are such uh, big believers uh, that cancer treatment should be addressed by more than one uh, than a single uh, uh, target, so with multiple mechanisms, you actually multiply your chances. Let's take a break. After the break, we go back with Mr. Isaac Israel. Mr. Israel is the CEO of Kitov Pharma, a pharmaceutical drug development company developing new options to treat osteoarthritis pain and hypertension simultaneously, as well as novel anti-cancer drugs. Over the years, you've brought them into your home. You were prescribed opioids after the C-section and after dad's back injury. They helped when you were in pain. And you held on to them, just in case. But did you know holding on to unused opioids puts your family at risk? Trouble with opioids can start at home with unused medicines, such as pills, patches, and syrups. You can remove the risk and protect your family. Find out how at www.fda.gov slash drug disposal. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hofflin and Sonia Portillo. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hofflin, and this is the Alcazine Brief. If you're just joining us, today in the Alcazine Brief, we talk with Mr. Isaac Israel. Mr. Israel is the CEO of Kit of Pharma, a pharmaceutical drug development company developing new options to treat osteoarthritis pain and hypertension simultaneously, as well as novel anti-cancer drugs. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Young in Brief. And Mr. Israel, um, before the break, we were talking a little bit about uh, the different uh, options that are in immuno-oncology. Now, immuno-oncology is very fascinating because it allows um, a particular drug uh, to really interact with the immune system activate that, make sure that your body you fights a, a particular disease, which is always very complex in oncology. What you've been telling us is, is that while those drugs are very effective, there is also a need to make sure uh, of a combination therapy to make those drugs even more effective. Your drug, uh, CM24, is being developed by, your, by the researchers in your company targets a, a so-called surface protein called CCAM1. Uh, Tell me a little yeah. bit more about that particular drug and, and, and how that combination therapy actually works. Yeah, so let's start with going diving deeper into CM24. So I spoke before about the multiple mechanisms of action. So I, I would try to explain uh, the different uh, types of mechanisms here. So when we speak about CM24, 
first, we, we, we need to understand this is the first ever clinically tested monoclonal antibody that targets uh, CKM1. CKM1, as I mentioned, plays an important role in, in both the tumor cell as well as the immune cell in mm-hmm. cancer biology. This is very important. It's not only the, the tumor, but also the immune cell. We know that the expression of CKM1 is, is very high, not only on, uh, on the tumor cells, but also on the, on the uh, NK, cell, NK cells and T cells in general. So what is unique about uh, CKM1 is that first, as I mentioned again, that CKM1 is an important surface protein uh, in the biology of the cancer. I spoke about the two different, uh, the dual mechanism of uh, inhibiting not only CKM1, but also CKM5, which is very important. And then, very, very interesting, is that CKM1 interacts, we know from, from the literature and from others, that CKM1 interacts and regulates TIM3. TIM3 is another immune checkpoint, very, you know, very important, that's known to be play, to play a key role in, in cancer. T1 is actually inducing the immune exhaustion of T cells. As a side note, for example, GSK and Novartis, you know, are going after uh, team three, and this is very important as not only this multiple mechanisms of action that, that, that I explained about CKM1, but also the combination and the synergistic combination between CKM1, which we target by CM24, and team three is, uh, is very interesting and is the potential for another mechanism of action. So, so, so this is, you know, this is in general about CM24. This is what CM24 does. For my understanding, and I think our audience would be interested in that as well, is if you look at the different combination therapies, it's like you have a very effective drug. In this case, for example, that is nivolumab, um, which is an immuno-oncology drug. But obviously there are certain things in which the drug may not necessarily function optimally to actually effectively kind of kill that particular form of cancer that you're targeting. Now, what your drug does, and there are maybe other forms of, of, of the same approach, is more or less open the door for uh, nivolumab um, and other uh, similar drugs to actually do yeah. that work. Is, is, that, is that a good analogy? Uh, I, this is a perfect analogy. Uh, actually, the, uh, a very good analogy is the, is the um, PD-1 and PD-L1. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is very much uh, similar that, uh, in, that compares to what we do. CKM1 is uh, tackling, you know, the tumor side, like the, the PD-1 is also tackling the, the PD-L1 side or the, 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 the lymphocyte side, which is what usually the PD-L1 do. So, so this is a very mm-hmm. good conceptually, you know, analogous to what, uh, what uh, PD-L1 and PD-L1 is. But the, good, the beauty here is that this is, you know, you can reach a very similar conceptual effect by using one antibody rather than using two antibodies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so if you if you now look at um, the drug, because um, I mean, not every patient may benefit from this, right? And that makes the the, the application of immuno oncology also very difficult. In many cases, uh, what you need is a companion diagnostic test to make sure that the patient is really uh, the right candidate for the drug. Um, in if the patient is not the right candidate for the drug, then the drug does not work at all. Period. How does that work with, with, with the combination therapy that you propose? So the CM24 with nivolumab, for example, is there also a combination drug involved? Of co- uh, sorry, and an, um, companion diagnostic involved to make sure that it m- works? Just in one uh, general note, this is, this is a very interesting uh, question because until today, there is a big you know, debate in the uh, um, oncology community regarding the... the whether you need to, for example, if you are for PD-1, if you want to test the PD-1 level of expression on the tumor or not. Sometimes you want to use uh, many physicians and in many clinical trials, you want to, to test the, the mutation burden of the, of the tumor. And sometimes in, in few trials, uh, you see no difference or no significant, uh, at least no significant difference between uh, patients that are expressing high level of PD1 that are and, and patients that are not expressing high level PD1. So this, this is a very uh, important and, and interesting uh, uh, field. In our case, CM24. So we definitely we have a very clear protein, the CKM1. Mm-hmm. 
and and we definitely want to be to be able to to test the expression of the of the uh, of the second one on, on at least on the tumor level and for this purpose we are planning to and as part of the planned clinical trial that we are planning with the uh, BMS we are uh, definitely planning to develop an assay that will be able to separate between patients potential patients with high level of sicken one and uh, patients with a low level of sicken one and potentially I'm not sure that we, we will use this as a, as a recruitment criteria, but at least in the, in the, in the first phase of the trial, we, will, we want to measure this, uh, this criteria in order to be able in further trials to, to better select, be, be able to better select uh, the patient population. Right. Now, you, you refer to um, clinical trials. Uh, you also refer to your collaboration with uh, nivolumab. Now, to, uh, for full disclosure, nivolumab is um, an, a drug uh, that is uh, branded in the United States as uh, Obdivo. Uh, it's also a drug that is manufactured and, and distributed by Bristol Myers Squibb, and that's one of your partners. And now, when you when yeah. you look at the clinical development and the clinical trials that you do, tell me a little bit about uh, the the phase one two the clinical trials that you're planning maybe when 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 are you going to start working on those clinical trials initially we first the bottom line is we are planning to initiate a phase one two uh, clinical trial hopefully by uh, the first half of next year in a clinical collaboration with BM, with Bristol Myers mm-hmm. but we need we need to go step uh, step back and to to provide some background because uh, we have a very interesting history. Uh, when this antibody was developed by Merck. So initially, what Merck did, let's, even one further further step, looking at the preclinical data that was uh, generated with this, uh, this antibody, initially it's a monotherapy. You can see, you know, very good res- response of, uh, of the CN24 uh, as a monotherapy. And then we can see also a very positive preclinical study that showed a synergistic effect of CN24 when used in combination with uh, an anti-PD-1 uh, treatment. That's important. Then, if you look at the phase one study that was uh, performed by Merck, so initially CM24 was tested as a monotherapy. This is important. Uh, in Merck trial, this drug was never tested in combination with uh, Keytruda or any other uh, PD-1. So speaking about the phase one, when, when major endpoint was obviously the safety, so you, we can see that uh, CN24 demonstrated a very, you know, a good safety profile until up to 10 milligrams per key. This was the the, uh, the maximum tolerated dose at this time with a single agent therapy. Then looking at, and this is this is this is very interesting phenomena. Looking at the data at the time it was uh, performed, it was generated by, by Merck. We see that the data revealed that. Receptors saturation was not reached at the target, the target site, which means that the, the tumor were not saturated with a dose uh, which was used that was up to 10 milligrams. On Merck uh, analysis of the PK data that was generated in the study, Merck suggested that in order to achieve a receptor saturation for a once every three weeks uh, regimen, the regiment, uh, this is, by the way, this is the regiment that is used by uh, Merck's Keturda mm-hmm. once every three weeks. You need to further, in order to reach saturation, you need to further increase the dose of CN24 dramatically. However, according to the same Merck data that we have, we see that if you want to achieve once every two weeks regimen, which is what you need to, uh, to, to lower, to, 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 to reach the receptor saturation, and what you need is to is a much lower dose of CN24. So we think this is why we, but not only we, but also uh, BMS, we believe that Abdivo or Nivolumab is a much better candidate to combine with CN24. Let's take a short break here, and then we talk some more with Mr. Isaac Israel. Most of us like to be out in the sun. That's why sunscreen and other safety measures are key to protecting your skin from aging and cancer. The FDA recommends using a sunscreen with an SPF of 15 or higher. Also, look for broad spectrum on the label. That means both harmful ultraviolet A and B rays are blocked. Remember, SPF plus broad spectrum equal healthy fun in the sun. 
Visit www.fda.gov sunscreen for more information. A message from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hofflin and Sonia Portillo. Welcome back. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Ongesim Brief. If you're just joining us, today in the Ongesim Brief, we talk with Mr. Isaac Israel. Mr. Israel is the CEO of Kitov Pharma, a pharmaceutical drug development company developing new options to treat osteoarthritis pain and hypertension simultaneously, as well as novel anti-cancer drugs. Uh, Mr. Israel, welcome back to the Ongesim Brief. Before the break, we were talking a little bit about uh, the history of uh, CM24, the drug that you are developing when it was used in a combination trial with Merck and also as a, as a standalone drug uh, with Merck uh, and why in the current situation, um, the, the, the combination with nivolumab, a uh, drug being developed by bristol myers Quip or BMS, might um, be uh, more advantageous. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, in order to, to understand why, why uh, nivolumab is a, is a better candidate and why actually we, we engage in a clinical collaboration with the BMS, we need to go back into the look at the analysis that was performed by Merck of the PK data that, uh, that was generated uh, in the study, in the single study. And the PK data is suggesting that in order to achieve a receptor saturation for a once every three weeks regimen, which is the, the regimen used uh, with Merck's Ketwitter, you need to further increase the dose of CM24. However, according to the same data by Merck, once every two weeks uh, regimen requires a lower dose of uh, CM24. So this is why, which is, by the way, this is uh, uh, once every two weeks, this is the regimen that is used by uh, Nivolumab or Obdivo. This is why we believe, and not only we as Keto, but also BMS, we believe that uh, Obdivo is a much better candidate to combine, to, to, to combine with CM24 rather than uh, Keturida. Uh, as such, we believe that uh, exploring the efficacy of CM24 in combination with Obdivo is the best path uh, forward. Right. Um, so that, that's, that's where you are right now. And when are you going to start uh, those uh, clinical trials? And are they going to be also being conducted in the United States and other parts of the world, which other parts of the world are also um, in being involved? So the plan is, uh, first, we need to uh, complete or to make the acquisition of same wave uh, official, take uh, until the estimated till the third quarter. And then Keto will actually take up the collaboration agreement with BMS uh, in order to initiate the phase uh, one slash two trial. The clinical collaboration, collaboration with BMS is, is to BMS uh, coordinate the protocol design mm-hmm. for the trial, and under the terms of the agreement, uh, we will fund sponsor the study, and BMS will supply uh, supply of data. We plan to, according to our plan, we first have to go uh, back to the FDA and uh, file for an amendment to the existing IMB, mm-hmm. and then subsequently we, we 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 plan to initiate the clinical trial, which is planned for the first half of 2019, and and 20. So that's that's basically in the very near future. Yeah. So if if you look at and it's always kind of uh, very difficult to uh, to see that because the phase one combination phase two trial, um, you're looking at the uh, the safety profile and you look at the efficacy of, of this particular drug. But of course, you already have a hunch in, in because Merck did the, their own trials uh, with the drug. So where are you leaning leaning against? I mean, are, are you looking to in a situation that you you have very high confidence in in the success of this trial? Yeah. So, so the plan is initially we don't we don't need to go uh, back and initiate and start the phase one uh, from scratch because we already have good safety uh, profile data that was generated in the first trial. So the plan is just uh, a continue more or less at the same. Dose that was uh, tested with Merck, uh, uh, which is 10 milligrams, and escalate escalate the, the dose as a monotherapy until we reach uh, the required saturation that like we discussed before, and then we'll also test a very short phase of uh, efficacy in the combination with the uh, uh, nivolumab. Next, we we plan to continue into an efficacy phase or an expansion arm 
which is designed for patients with uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And then definitely the the uh, the idea or the the target is to um, evaluate the efficacy of the drug in combination with uh, nivolumab. Now, if you if you look at because this is this is definitely an, an interesting thing, you're looking at patients with uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Are there also other therapeutic areas uh, within the oncology uh, area where you're looking at uh, as a potential for CM24? Yes. So, so initially, we think that, uh, that that's true. We initially, we, we believe the best match and the most you know, logical step to take right now is to test the combination of uh, CM24 with a PD-1 immunocheckpoint inhibitor. That's, and this is what we are doing with BMS. And, that, and the reason is that, that that drug nivolumab is approved in that indication. Yes, there are other uh, currently uh, more trials. That this is a very interesting arena. You know, there, there are other attempts. Uh, for example, combinations of uh, PD-1 with chemotherapy, and we have the combination that uh, BMS has itself with a combination of uh, Obdivo and Yervory. That's uh, that's also an interesting target, but uh, a candidate. But this is definitely, and we, we must be aware that uh, lung cancer in general is the second most common cancer in the U.S., uh, which is, you know, it right. makes up to 85% of all lung cancer case, cases, the, the, the non-small cell lung cancer. So, so that's, that's a huge market, and I think there is, uh, there's still a lot of room for, for many different uh, interesting approach, new approaches for, uh, for patients. Again, if you, if you look at that patient population, it's definitely a, a larger population I think if you look at the uh, nivolumab um, and, and the treatment of, of uh, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, you've seen in this particular drug a major shift in the fact that it's now not only focusing on, on lung cancer in, in patients that have smoked or are smo- or used to smoke. There is a major shift in that, that younger people uh, might also uh, get lung cancer even if they have never smoked in some situations. Which was um, right. something that we start noticing about uh, maybe five, ten, year, ten years ago. I mean, as really the data came out of that. So this drug is really looking at that particular population. Are you with CM24 making nivolumab more uh, effective in that respect, in making it even a better tool to to, to get patients um, or, or lean towards a longer um, survival benefit? Yeah, this is definitely the target and the goal. We we have great great preclinical data demonstrating the the synergistic effect between PD one inhibitors and CN twenty four also in lung cancer. So so we we have to you know to 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 remember that even today the the response rate of PD one inhibitors is especially in non small can, uh, lung cancer is is is, is quite limited. We know that the, the, the response rate today is about 20 to 30 percent, which, which is not good enough. I mean, for, for those who are patients that are responding to the, to the therapy, that's, you know, that's, that's a huge breakthrough. That's, that's great. Uh, that's not, you know, we, we see results that, that we, we, we could never see in other uh, uh, therapies. But still, we are speaking about 20 to 30 percent of the patients. So there is a huge uh, space. Uh, and a huge number of patients that are not well treated nowadays, even though we have the PD-1 inhibitors. So, so we believe that combining the two, um, uh, the PD-1 and CM24, the CCM uh, um, immune checkpoint, could definitely, hopefully, increase the the number of uh, responding patients to the to the therapy. Okay, now. After the break, we're going to uh, talk a little bit uh, about some of the interesting uh, things that you've been working on in development of of other drugs, but also about the relationship that you have uh, by taking over a company called FameWave and and the importance uh, for you. Let's take a short break. After the break, we're back with our interview with Mr. Isaac Israel. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Youngest in Brief. Clinical trials allow researchers to introduce new hope by providing participants access to cutting-edge and potentially life-saving treatments. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more. Together, we can stand up for all of us. Did you know that generic drugs are just as safe and effective as brand-name drugs? Generics might look different, but they work the same way. And they can even save you money. 
Don't believe me? Ask your doctor or pharmacist or visit fda.gov slash generic drugs. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Yonkers in Brief. Our interview today with Mr. Isaac Israel was recorded in April 2019. Mr. Um, Israel, welcome back uh, to the Yonkers in Brief. Before the break, we were talking about uh, a lot of very interesting developments when it comes to uh, CM24, the clinical trials, the treatment areas where you're looking at uh, like uh, non-small cell lung cancer, the relationship that you have with uh, in the clinical trials uh, with um, uh, Bristol Myers Quip. Now, another interesting relationship uh, that you have, you, uh, co- your company just recently acquired a company called FameWave. Can you tell me a little bit about that and why that is such a strategic and such an important decision for, for the company? Yeah, sure. So the acquisition of FameWave is, is important. As, uh, it's very important for us. First and, and most important is that, uh, that the major asset that FameWave has is the CN24. And as discussed before, we, we believe uh, that CN24 has a great potential in, in cancer therapy in, in general. And second, this is very important uh, uh, for us because by actually acquiring a frame wave, we are um, building a relationship and we are uh, taking up the collaboration agreement that uh, frame wave has with, uh, with uh, Bristol Myers. So initially, it will make uh, keto a clinical stage oncology. So far, we we were uh, we had a preclinical stage uh, asset that we are advancing into the clinic. Hopefully, by the end uh, um, by the end of this year. But now we are not only a preclinical stage company, but we are a, a clinical stage company with an asset that was uh, clinically tested and ready for a continuation towards uh, a, a phase two trial. So that's altogether makes. Uh, we believe makes Keto a much more interesting and complete company uh, at this stage. Now, talk about the complete company. You were talking about some of the preclinical uh, uh, products that you have in in early development, and we yeah. didn't really talk a lot about that. But obviously, that's also a very interesting and exciting development. Is a product um, that still has a designation called NT two one nine. Tell me a little bit about this particular drug and and why that may ultimately be very important. So we are, we are also very, very excited about uh, NT219. This is a drug, we, we acquired the company that, uh, that uh, at the time owned uh, this drug back in uh, uh, 2017. Since then, we have managed to produce, uh, you know, a very a large body of uh, very uh, compelling preclinical data demonstrating the efficacy of this drug in combination with many different uh, existing and approved uh, cancer therapies. The claim to fame, and, and I, can, I can speak about the mechanism of action, which I think is fascinating, but they're, 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 just in one sentence, the claim to fame of uh, NT219 is being able to overcome tumor drug resistance, yeah. which wow. is yeah. a, a huge and major, major problem in the industry. Yeah, that's, that's definitely interesting. Yeah, nowadays, you know, you, you start treating a patient with a, a, a targeted therapy, chemotherapy, or even immunotherapy, but uh, after after you know after some time, the patients or the tumor actually find its way to circumvent uh, the drug and and develop resistance. With NT219, what we do, we are uh, uh, speaking on a higher level. We are blocking uh, two important signal pathways that are associated with uh, with uh, the development of resistance. The first one is uh, STAT3 which is well-known in the industry and has also some role in the innovation of the uh, microenvironment of the tumor. Uh, and the second is uh, IRS 1 slash 2, which is also very important and a target that played a very important role. So what we do by blocking these two important survival mechanisms, in a way we uh, uh, resensitize the tumors for the to the original drug, so so the the original drug uh, can work again or can work better than the way it worked before. You know, after it, uh, the resistance has been acquired. And, and the importance is that basically you get that same open door, uh, closed door structure where 
this particular drug uh, may not necessarily open the door uh, for the chemotherapy or the therapy that comes afterwards, but it makes it possible, it makes it more sensitive to, 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 to that. that. That's correct? That's, that's correct. Uh, we, we plan in our uh, plan clinical trials, we, we, we plan to, um, admin, to, 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 to treat with NTP19 in combination with existing uh, cancer drugs, but at, at the first day, I mean, together with, uh, with the existing drugs, means we don't want to wait until the resistance to be uh, developed. What we know from, from, from our preclinical trials and, and very extensive PDX models that we, we performed so far is that the best uh, results that you want, to, that you, you, you get using uh, uh, anti-219 is when you start uh, administrating anti-219 at the same time when you start administrating the approved drug. And that way we, we showed in many different models that we managed to delay the development of the, of the resistance. So we don't want to, to wait until the resistance is, has been acquired. We want to start treating for day one and enlarge the period of the original drug to, to work. Now, the question, of course, that people will ask, I mean, so do you, you add this particular drug uh, to make sure that it is a uh, kind of a preemptive strike, so to say, but is that necessary with all patients? Uh, because obviously some patients may really show this resistance. Other patients may not necessarily have that particular resistance. So how do you measure that part? That's a good question. And, and uh, we, we, we don't know. Obviously, we can't predict which patient will uh, develop a resistance and which patient is not going to develop a resist uh, resistance. And that's exactly why we want to avoid you know, the resistance. Nothing will happen. Hopefully, we, we, we start the trial finding the MTD and make sure that the NT219 is, is uh, well tolerated. Right. But assuming this is well tolerated and this is uh, what we, we saw in, in early preclinical studies uh, to check toxicity. So, we, we, and, and we're speaking of very you know, advanced uh, cancer patients. So, we believe that if we, if we give NT219 to all patients, so we manage, we don't want to wait until the resistance to, to develop. We want to avoid the resistance and nothing will happen, you know, if some patients will be administrated with, uh, with NT219 and eventually not develop resistance because that's, you know, that's good. So, so, so the approach is to be able to start treating the patients in the current existing therapy with NT219 and the goal will be to increase the time between uh, uh, the initiation of the, of the, of the approved drug and the development of the resistance. If we manage, you know, if no resistance is out there, so this is maybe the, you know, that's the, that's the, the best outcome you can, you can expect. Right. So they're basically lo looking at, at um, a scenario where, again, you, you preemptively uh, strikes to make sure that, that the drug works, that there is no resistance, and that patients fully benefit uh, from the therapy that's being given to them. Right. Exactly. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Founded upon the key principles of immune response, immuno-oncology research seeks to understand how the body's natural defenses can be leveraged to empower anti-tumor immunity. Immuno-oncology is different than traditional cancer treatments. It works by augmenting the immune system's natural ability to see and eliminate cancer cells much in the same way it protects us against infection from viruses and bacteria. As a living, dynamic system, the immune system is able to detect cancer anywhere in the body, which is especially important in treating patients with cancers that have spread to other organs. Recent clinical success has resulted in the approval of a number of novel immuno-oncology therapies, both alone and in combination with other treatments for nearly 20 types of cancer, including advanced solid tumor and blood cancers, as well as cancers with a specific genetic defect resulting in a high frequency of mutations, regardless of tissue type. In bladder cancer, melanoma, and certain types of lung cancer, these immuno-oncology therapies have received approval by the United States Food and Drug Administration as first-line treatment, replacing, or in the case of combination therapies, improving conventional treatments like chemotherapy. Immuno-oncology therapies are also FDA-approved to treat some patients for whom prior treatments were ineffective. 
Today, clinical trials are ongoing to test the benefits of immuno-oncology agents in many other types of cancer. For more information about immuno-oncology, cancer, as well as cancer diagnosis and prevention, please visit the website of the American Cancer Society at www.cancer.org. For more information about clinical trials and drug development and how new anti-cancer agents are benefiting patients, please visit the website of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, or ASCO. Here you can find more doctor-approved information. For us here at the Oncocene Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners, sponsors, and advertisers, for your ongoing support. Thanks to your support, our program now has wider reach with distribution via iHeartRadio, in addition to PRX Public Radio Exchange and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. And your support made it possible that our program is also distributed in Canada and Australia. And you can download our program via iTunes. You can also listen to the Oncocene Brief via Spotify and other streaming media. In Arizona, you can listen to the Oncocene Brief via Independent Talk 1100 KFNX, one of the top 10 radio stations in Arizona, reaching almost 5 million people throughout the state. For more information about that, check our online journal Oncocene at www.oncocene.com. If you want to support our program, please visit our website and look for the Oncocene Brief. Here you can find more information about the way you can help us. And your support for this program is important. It allows us to bring you interviews with experts involved in the development of novel diagnostics and new treatments. If you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866, and we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you all, and thank you for listening. And join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncocene Brief. The Oncocene Brief is produced for Sun Valley Communication by Peter Hofland, Sonia Portillo, Evan Wint, David Kaler, and Sean Mayer, and distributed by InPress Media Group. Support for the Oncocene Brief comes from listeners of this station and our commercial underwriters and advertisers. For more information about underwriting and sponsoring options, contact Sean Mayer in California at 949-923-1660 or visit our website at oncozine.com forward slash underwriting. The Oncozine Brief contains health and medicine-related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health. If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it.